Keldrick Falk gave us plenty of reasons to be excited for this season. You are Locked On Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. It's a happy hour edition. I'm your host, Zach Blackerby. Thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first or second listen every single day. Of course, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every single day. Rewinding back to the conversation we had with Keldrick Falk on Thursday. He was very impressive, talked highly about his colleagues and teammates involved in Auburn's pass rushes upcoming season, gave us a lot to be excited about. That's coming up. And then after that, I hopped on Locked On SEC with Chris Gordy to talk about Auburn's season. All that coming up on today's bonus edition of Locked On Auburn. All right, I'm here talking with Keldrick Falk, Auburn defensive end, and probably the tallest player I've had on <laughs> on the show. I mean, it's got to be a cool thing to get the chance to represent a school like Auburn as a as a second year player. How how was today? Uh, today was uh, amazing. Like, you're getting to see so many different people, so many different personalities, um, and then you get to represent where you're from, your school, and uh, your teammates back at home. Yeah, yeah. So many of your teammates, even last year talked about how you came in here and you were a leader day one. Is that intentional or is that just kind of who you are? Uh, it's, I would say it's kind of who I am. Yeah. Uh, of course, it, it was it was a little uh, nerve wracking at first uh, going into my freshman year, but uh, now it's, it's, it feel more natural. Like It feels mm-hmm. natural to be a leader on the team. Yeah. I mean, the second off season right. in a college program, I mean, it's it's got to be more comfortable because right. you, you kind of know what to expect. Right. Yeah, it, it's, it's, total, it's, it's, it's way more comfortable than it was uh, going into my freshman year. Yeah. So um, just having those guys like Marcus Harris, uh, Justin Rogers, um, Jalen McLeod coming from App State. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, just having those guys mentor me through my, throughout my freshman year and then taking what they taught me and applying it to uh, my leadership on the team and – uh, how I approach every day. Yeah. I assume improving as a pass rusher is something you and, and the right. rest of the defensive line is working on right. this offseason. Having a guy, a veteran guy like Jalen, on the other side of you, we assume that you guys are going to be going to be the bookend rushers in a lot of situations. Right. Having a guy like him, one, to teach you, but two, just to kind of draw attention from a pass protection standpoint, that's got to be exciting for you. Right. It's, it's, a, it's completely exciting. Like, uh, just getting to pick his brain a little bit on how to pass rush and what to expect uh, on different sets and uh, how to set up pass rush moves. Like, you know, he had a phenomenal season last year. Yeah. Uh, especially when he came off of a, of an injury with his ankle. You know, even with that, he still had a great season. So, uh, just getting to pick his brain every day uh, and you know, just trying to mimic. Uh, a little bit of what he does. Yeah, and then Kieran Crawford comes in, right. who's kind of a similar situation to Jalen, just a year behind. Right. Uh, I mean, as far as all the guys that they've had in the portal, he's probably the one I'm most excited about right. just because of the upside. I mean, he seems like he's going to be a, a solid addition. What have you learned from him so far, if anything? Oh, man, he, yeah, he, um, he's been, he's been the guy that, you know, I can relate to more because he's, he's closer to my age. Yeah, a little so, younger, sure. Yeah, so we, we work out together. We we train together sometimes. So, like, you know, getting getting to be around him and building that connection with him like early, uh, especially because he has two more years of eligibility left. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, and of course I pick his brain too because he's been he's been in a different place. Right. So getting to learn uh, some of the different things that he's learned at, at another school uh, has been has been very like. Uh, profitable to me. Sure. Yeah. As far as the new defense, DJ Durkin comes in, I mean, is it noticeably different for you what you're doing this offseason versus last offseason, or is it similar maybe for the defensive end spot? Um, I'll say it's pretty similar. The, the difference I'll say is we get to play free on the edge. So okay. I would say like uh, you know, when 
whenever we whenever we make a check on the on the on the defense, mm-hmm. it's you live with it and we play together. Yeah. Um, and then some of the calls we have in are for us to go and wreak havoc on on the offense. I mean, that sounds fun. Right. It sounds yeah. right up your alley, right? Exactly, right up my alley, man. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time, Keldrick, and uh, yeah, can't wait to watch you this season. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Outstanding stuff from Keldrick Falk. Coming up, my conversation with Chris Gordy in just a moment right here on Locked on Auburn. Today's show brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Look, I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. And fortunately, with FanDuel, they don't have to. Yes, the pro sports are done. But look, this summer, FanDuel is giving all customers a boost or a bonus daily every single day. That's right. There's something new for everyone every day all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com. And start making the most out of your summer and look a trend all week throughout SEC Media Days in Dallas was, hey, maybe we're too low on Auburn. I'm half expecting that number, FanDuel seven and a half total wins for the Auburn Tigers. I'm expecting it to go up just a little bit. So you may want to head over to FanDuel right now and go ahead and get that value if you're taking the over for the Tigers. So once again, head over to FanDuel.com. And start making the most of your summer. FanDuel is the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball and the Locked On Podcast Network. As we get closer to the start of the season, we start to do our previews, previewing all the different teams around the SEC and checking in with our buddy Zach Blackerby, who covers uh, Locked On Auburn and all things Auburn Tigers. And Zach, as we jump right into it, what's the biggest question for the Auburn Tigers as we count down to the season? Which Peyton Thorne are we going to get? Are we going to get, you know, 11 wins Peyton Thorne that we saw at Michigan State? Or are we going to get the Peyton Thorne at Auburn from a year ago? Um, they've done everything to make it not about Peyton Thorne by adding, you know, talented receivers both through the portal and through the high school ranks, as well as Coach Freeze taking over play calling and implementing a, a better scheme than what we saw last year on the plane. So to me, as what Peyton Thorne are we going to get this season? Yeah, and, it, and it's crazy because we start to look through, you know, we were filling out our, our SEC preseason ballots and, you know, first first team and, you know, all that kind yeah. of stuff. And I start to look at all the quarterbacks and I go, man, like, even if Peyton Thorne is really good, is he, is he, I mean, can he break the top five in terms of good quarterbacks in the SEC? I mean, there's a lot of good ones. I, I've been making the case, if he can be an average SEC quarterback, so around that eight spot, I think Auburn can win eight or nine games. It's, I don't think you need a lot from them. The running game's going to be there with Jarquez Hunter and Damari Austin and Jeremiah Cobb and this revamped offensive front. To me, it's, a, it's just don't lose games. Yeah. Just be a game manager. That's not a bad thing. That was, that was going to be my next question when you mentioned the backfield because – you know, we're doing we're doing our you know whatever pick three running backs or whatever from from the SEC, and I, it really got me thinking like, what is Jarquez Hunter going to be this year? Is it like simply put, can he be a top five rusher in the SEC this year? Yeah, it's almost it would almost be concerning if he wasn't. I think at this point, unless they truly balance it out and it's a three headed running attack, which could happen. But I expect Jarquez to get the bulk of the touches. This is a guy we all thought was going to go to the league after last season. Right. And it, there was never really any drama with it. He was pretty clear of like, hey, I'm coming back. You got to think Free sold him something. Because, I mean, he'd be signed with the team right now if he had gone. So, to me, he believes in what this offense could be. He believes that he fits in whatever role they discuss behind closed doors. And, and to me, yeah, I think Jarquez Hunter is going to be a big, big part of this offense, as he should be. Why was the run game not as dominant last year for Auburn? It was pretty good. It was a top five rushing attack uh, last year. It's just it was kind of split, and it took a while to get going. It's like uh, I guess it was against Georgia when they realized, oh, we can run the football. So, I mean, th- there was a stretch of the season where Auburn had, like, the second-best rushing game in the SEC. It trailed off a little bit with, with the Iron Bowl performance and then the bowl game. But Auburn was one of the more uh, efficient rushing attacks in the conference last year. Yeah, I guess I just, when I think back to last year, I think of Cody Schrader, Quinchon Judkins, Ray mm-hmm. Davis, um, Jalen Wright at, at Tennessee. So, I, you know, Tarquist Hunter's right there. He was 900 yards rushing, seventh in the conference. But um, I just, you know, all those other guys were over 1,000 yards last year. It just feels like 
he's got to do that this year. Yeah, yeah. And it took him a while to get going. You know, they never, like, said it. But it seemed like the first few games he was injured. And he missed some time with the suspension as well. So it just took him a while to really get going. But once he did, he was one of the more um, dominant rushers in the conference last year. And he just gotta, he's got to start faster. And Auburn's... Auburn's first four games, he should be able to do that. He should be able to run against, you know, the non-conference foes, against Cal, against Arkansas. And then Auburn's hopefully sitting 4-0 and when they host Oklahoma. And then it's like, okay, what do we really have here? You felt good about the O-line? I think it should be better than a year ago. Um, you know, they, they brought in Percy Lewis from Mississippi State. That's been the biggest addition. Connor Liu is probably going to be a Remington Award finalist when it's all said and done. Very, very, uh, very talented center. And then, you know, Xavier Miller, right tackle. He started him a year too early probably last year, but he was just so good but so raw. But they wanted to put him on the field. So now a full season under his belt, I expect him to take that next step forward. Yeah, I think Auburn's offensive line will be a strength of the team. Who excites you on defense? Eugene Asante, uh, especially the way DJ Durkin is probably going to use him. He loves versatile linebackers at all of his previous stops. Eugene Asante certainly checks all those boxes. A breakout candidate this year to me is Kay and Lee, the young corner, was committed to Ohio State. It was one of the first flips that Hugh Freeze pulled off once he got the job. Kay and Lee replacing DJ James and Nehemiah Pritchett. To me, I, I think he could be one of the best corners in the SEC. I think he's going to catch a lot of people by surprise this year. Keontae Scott, we know what we're getting. Is the right? other side, yeah. Well, do we? Because he, he was pretty much a, a middle-of-the-field defender. And then it sounds like, okay, he was thinking about entering the portal. Some places reported that he did enter the portal. Then he came back. But it sounds like he wants to play outside corner. And so he's going to be the other, other corner opposite Kay and Lee. And to me, I, I think he's a better nickel or middle-of-the-field defender. But he wants to play outside corner, so it sounds like they're letting him do it. So, to, like, he should be good, but, like, we haven't really seen him do a whole lot of that. We saw it in the bowl game. It didn't look too great. Right. Um, but, you know, it, it was a bowl game, and nobody on Auburn really looked great other than Hank Brown. I'm excited about Keldrick, Keldrick Falk. He was highly doubted, recruit. Yeah. But just the sack last year, like, well, how, do, how do we get him going? Yeah, I mean, I think you look at history, and, like, most five-star freshman ends and pass rushers, they don't do much as freshmen in the SEC. I don't think that's anything against them. It's that next year. And yeah. so what does Auburn do? They bring him to SEC Media Days. The first time Auburn's brought a true sophomore to represent them at Media Days. I think that's pretty high praise. So he's got to take that next step like so many elite pass rushers do from their freshman year to their sophomore year. I think Keldrick's in a certain situation where he should be able to do that because the guy opposite of him, Jalen McLeod, has the potential to be a double-digit sack type player. I think he could be elite this season. He also brought in Kieran Crawford, the transfer from Arkansas State. He's my favorite transfer addition this offseason for the Tigers. I don't think Keldrick's going to get double-teamed a lot because of guys like that. And so that should open the door for you to take that next step. You mentioned the offense and the play call. So you think it's simply it's just going to be Hugh calling the play? I mean, like, how, how – why have an OC? Like, how is that – what's that dynamic going to be? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he's going to be involved in the game planning and maybe, you know, help out with that opening script that so many teams like to use now. But I think when it comes down to it, they'll have a say, but it's going to be Hugh Freeze's call. And, Gordy, I think it should be. Yeah. You hire Freeze to build your program, and I think he does that by recruiting, which we've seen him hit the ground running on. And then he's one of the best offensive minds in football. That's why you hired him. Let's see him do it. Let's talk about how the schedule shapes up. It's, I mean, it's a cakewalk early. You, you should be able to cruise through Alabama, A&M, Cal. You know, we'll see what they are, but they come to Auburn, New Mexico. This is a New Mexico state. Uh, Ar Thank Ar goodness. Arkansas after that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we'll see what Arkansas looks like by that point. But you feel pretty good about starting 4-0 and going into that uh, Oklahoma game on September 28th. Yeah, no question about it. Oklahoma coming to Jordan-Hare Stadium is the most important game on Auburn's schedule. It's, it's absolutely crucial. Because if you start 5-0 and and you look at FanDuel's over-under line of 7.5 wins and you've got 5, you're 5 for 5 with, you know, what, 7 more to go, yeah. you feel pretty good about it. You feel pretty good about it. So to me, that Oklahoma game is absolutely crucial. And this Oklahoma team, like, they think they're a college football playoff contender. I'm not buying that. You've got to replace your entire starting offensive line. You've got a new quarterback. That's just not typically a recipe for success. 
The problem is the middle to back part of the schedule at Mizzou, at, at Georgia, at Mizzou, at Kentucky, all you know in a row. There's a bye mixed in there, but uh, I yeah, mean, you, that's, you don't get a home game in October. <laughs> it's insane. Why do they do that? Who made the schedule? It's, yeah, thanks, that's, Sankey. Appreciate that. That's brutal. Now, obviously, I, I'm in the camp of if you can get one of those, I'm happy. Honestly, um, the most likely win is Kentucky in Lexington, I would think. I don't think you're going to argue against that. Yeah. But obviously, you know, it, I think on the road at Columbia is winnable. We'll see. I don't know where you are on Missouri. It seems like everybody's got a different opinion of Missouri. I think they're going to be pretty good. But I don't think, like, playing in Missouri is some, like, gauntlet. It's not going to Athens, yeah, right? I'm, you lose Blake Baker. You lose Cody Schrader, one of the best runners in the SEC last year. You lose... You know, corners like Ennis Rakestraw. I mean, it's just it's a lot of talent they lost and a really good D.C. It's not that they can't regroup, but I think a lot of people are going, okay, that was your one awesome year. Great, Mizzou. Mm -hmm. Now back to whatever you typically are. Yeah, and Missouri travels to UMass the week before they host Auburn, so, like, that's weird. a little weird. Who scheduled that? They play Alabama after they play Auburn, and mm. so, like, is there any chance of – Look, a head spot. Yeah, if they're having, if they're having a um, – you know, a special season like they think they're going to, that's a playoff game for them. Like going to yeah. Tuscaloosa, that's one of their biggest games they've had in recent memory. So are they possibly looking ahead? Like probably not, but th that'll be part of the storyline that week for sure. It's a pretty tough final two as well. I mean, you get, it's Texas A&M, but, you know, you get them at Auburn and then at Alabama in the Iron Bowl. But, yeah. you know, it's like you could, you could have six wins going into that stretch and go over and, uh, you know, a season that looked like, oh, seven, eight wins, all right, we're, we're, we're moving forward, could suddenly be six and six, and you're going to Shreveport for a bowl game. Yeah, yeah. I've said that Texas A&M game is the second most important game on the schedule after Oklahoma because that's one. If you want to overachieve this year, you've got to win that game. You've got to win that game. And so I, I have Auburn winning that game right now. I have them losing to Oklahoma but beating Texas A&M right now. But – We'll see how uh, we'll see how this Texas A&M team develops over the course of the year under Elko in its first season. I love this. You're a realist, a, a, a real realist of a, of an SEC fan. It's um, it's funny because a lot of people are like, nope, undefeated. I get so many people that say, why do you hate <laughs> Auburn? Or you're and you're such a homer. So yeah. I feel like if you're getting both, that's probably a good thing. Yeah, no doubt. He is Zach Blackerby, host of Locked On Auburn. We will continue previewing plenty of SEC teams coming down to the start of the season. Thank you so much to Keldrick. Thank you so much to Chris Gordy. And thank you so much, of course, to you. Please like the video. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Or at least consider it. At least consider it. And, of course, we'll be back tomorrow. This has been Locked on Auburn.